Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Lawrence Dorman. I am the chair of the Royal College of GPs in Northern Ireland, and I'm also a GP in Kilkeel. It's a pleasure to be with you here this afternoon, and I'm sorry we can't be meeting in person, but unfortunately, due to infection control measures, we have to meet virtually. I want to talk today about something which is apparently very simple, but which can improve patient care and health systems in general. It can probably be reduced to two words, professional courtesy. This initiative came about for a number of reasons over a period of years, where conventions of professional courtesy seem to be getting a little less friendly, a little gruff, a bit curt, and maybe sometimes even a little rude. Of course, we're all busy people and we want the best for our patients. But over a period of time, as clinicians working across primary and secondary care, we seem to have lost the art of simple, friendly communication. Let me highlight some of the key issues in our health system, and I'm sure many of you will recognise these in your own health systems. We had in Northern Ireland an ageing population, increasing multimorbidity and complexity, which leads to an increasing need for generalists. We had risks of specialists focusing on only one aspect of our patient care, and we had an increasing demand from our service from our patients, some of which was quite overly optimistic. In Northern Ireland, we had competition for resources between hospital specialties and between primary care and secondary care. Our hospital waiting times were getting quite long and our healthcare staff in Northern Ireland were not working as a team. Nobody seemed to be taking responsibility for test results, with hospital test results being sent directly to general practice. Unfortunately, none of this was facilitating the patient journey through our health and social care system. The mentality of your patient and my patient had become apparent between clinicians and there was frequently a misunderstanding of each other's roles and therefore unrealistic expectations about what either of us could do. With all of these issues in the background, we discovered that language matters. It be became clear that poor communication hinders patient care. A common theme from our discussions together was about the lack of appreciation or recognition of our respective workloads and the pressures of other clinicians. The use of language is very important. For example, when we refer a patient for an x-ray, we often use the term order to request an x-ray, but think of the word order, it is a command. We often use this term without thinking of the implications of a hierarchy with no consideration of another colleague's workload or pressures. In fact, what we should be doing is requesting an X-ray. We're not ordering our colleagues to do anything. Our colleagues in mental health, for example, felt their workload was also undervalued and underestimated. They were never going to be seeing the volume of patients a busy emergency department or family medicine clinic could. A mental health consultant could have the responsibility for two or three patients in one day, which may take up the work, same workload as a busy day in an emergency department. Once we recognise that everybody's workload involves issues that we don't understand, and when we force it ourselves to literally walk a day in another colleague's shoes, our behaviours will become amended and communications will be improved. Because of changes within our healthcare systems, the means of communications have changed over time supposedly to deliver better efficiency. Where previously we might have simply picked up the telephone and talked to a consulting colleague, perhaps someone we trained with at university, or sent a referral letter to a specific specialist, our systems converted to centralised appointment systems, where a letter of referral would be dealt with by an anonymous central administration system, assigning patients to random consultants. Our messaging and our language changed in those referrals. We all of us, both in primary and secondary care, lost the immediacy of our clinical relationships. We lost the easiness of our communication. We lost the safe space where we felt we were able to informally discuss complex case presentations. And at times the systems in place created real communication barriers while reducing our job satisfaction and efficiency. Using directive language does not endear us to our professional lives. 
our body language changes when we are told to do something in a certain way. And so the easiness we might have known previously gets lost. Let me put our initiative into context. Northern Ireland is a small geographical area, a part of the United Kingdom on the island of Ireland. It is a mix of very rural and very urban areas with plenty of mountains and hills. I work as a GP in Kilkeel, County Down, which is highlighted in red on the map. Kilkeel is a small fishing town on the east coast of Northern Ireland. Kilkeel fishermen specialise in catching prawns or langoustine, herring and bucky whelks, which are exported all around the world. Kilkeel is surrounded by the beautiful Mourne Mountains and the sea, which you may recognise as they are famous as being part of the film location for the Game of Thrones series. The mountains of Mourne provide a neat semicircle, making it a neat geographical location. And because of this geography, as a rural GP, it makes us dependent on our hospital and secondary care services. The efficient and effective use of hospital and secondary care for services is reliant on having good levels of communication between primary and secondary care services. My story in general practice starts a long time ago. I am the fourth generation GP in my family. My great-grandfather founded his clinic back in 1894. I entered medical school in Queen's University in 1993. I loved my university years and I made many friends and enjoyed studying medicine there. Unfortunately, most of my clinical learning took place in hospitals. My mentors were hospital consultants and while they were skilled and dedicated professionals, their view was possibly understandably that hospital medicine was intellectually superior to general practice and that hospital medicine was the most desirable career. But despite being close friends with my fellow students, a gulf emerged once we graduated and embarked on our own medical careers. When we undertook research amongst our peers during this initiative, it became clear that we had lost that easiness of communication. Despite being good friends as students, we were too busy or too involved in our careers to maintain the friendships and the natural way of communicating. For those of us who were successful in undertaking postgraduate general practice or family medicine residency training programmes, we felt that our choice of career was undervalued, dismissed as a specialty of failure or that it indicated that we were of lower ability and couldn't get into hospital specialty training programmes. A them and us mentality grew between primary and secondary care colleagues and old friends. It might be useful to point out here that in the United Kingdom, the terms GP and family doctor are interchangeable. I know in some countries, a GP needs to have no further qualifications than their initial medical degree. In the United Kingdom, we are required to undertake a three-year residency training programme to gain our professional qualification. When I left Queen's University and trained to be a GP, I was saddened at how our specialties general practice and hospital medicine had become less of a team. There was something about falling into different camps with family doctors in the community having little or no contact with their previous friends who worked in hospitals. GPs were frequently portrayed as less academic. Hospital colleagues were deemed by us to be out of touch and having poor communication skills. Speaking to my friends, I realised a gulf had emerged. All my colleagues in university class were intelligent, compassionate and committed to patient care. We could have chosen any specialty we wanted. Unfortunately, due to the negative modelling of our teachers, the undermining of general practice became prevalent. Our wider health and social care system has many different specialties and teams requiring collaboration between them. Unfortunately, in Northern Ireland, these natural interfaces had started to become barriers. An important report by Professor Val Walsh, many of you who know, was published in November 2016. By choice, not chance, highlights that general practice is a career choice for many, and those who embark to do so, do it by choice, not by chance. Professor Walsh highlighted that general practice needs to be celebrated, and that medical generalism is a specialty in its own right. The report also highlighted the importance of medical students having experience in and exposure to general practice in the community, community at the earliest possibility in their medical education 
and how we value this vital profession. Family medicine should be integral to every health system in the world. And while it is not the case everywhere yet, I am hopeful that in working towards the achievement of the Global Sustainable Development Goals and the promises made by every nation in the world at the Astana Declaration, that family medicine will soon be integral to each and every healthcare system around the world. So we need to get our communication right and to recognise how good communications between primary and secondary care can improve patient care and that of each of our health systems. The experience of my colleagues indicated that the communication between primary and secondary care was breaking down. This was not the exclusive experience of my generation. The relationships between primary and secondary care colleagues had been eroding over a number of generations. Underfunded and unresourced work was being assigned from secondary care to primary care with no consideration of workload or workforce capacity. Similarly, secondary care doctors were also frustrated. GP referral letters for secondary care assessment or opinion were frequently inadequate, with poor information or clear asks. The language used was also very, not very collegial, more of an instruction. There was no obvious breakpoint in communication, but there were definitely fractured. And as I mentioned previously, there were a number of interconnected factors which had gradually eroded that easiness of communication. Over time, there developed a real them and us mentality between primary and secondary care, and we needed to address it before our communications collapsed. Our patients were caught in the middle of this situation, with a slowing referral system managed centrally with neither the patient's GP nor the hospital consulting knowing what the patient's referral trajectory would look like. The only solution to these issues was to work together. In 2018, the Royal College of GPs in Northern Ireland took the lead and instigated and led on a collaborative piece of work, with the full range of specialties being represented by the retrospective Royal Colleges. Through organised discussions, both formal and informal, we determined that we needed to decide on a common goal of re-establishing successful communication between primary and secondary care, which, if we achieved it, would lead to better patient safety, better clinical outcomes for patients with much improved job satisfaction for all of us, and improved recruitment and retention of clinicians in each specialty. Getting to that early stage of deciding on a common goal required a series of things to be in place, and it took time. The practicalities of meeting together when we were all under immense job pressure was difficult. But we held a series of roundtable discussions where every voice had equal weight, where every person representing their specialty was considered an equal. Everyone was encouraged to listen and to be open and honest about their experiences of communicating with fellow clinicians. We openly recognised and tried to resolve and acknowledge that if there was a problem, it was up to us to address it. That helped us to own it and want to resolve it. Let's face it, as clinicians, we like to resolve problems. This time, the problem was with us and how we communicated with each other. Together, we formulated 10 communication principles. There could have been more, but we got them down to what we thought was a manageable number. All 14 medical royal colleges working within the Northern Ireland healthcare system were involved in the discussions and the development of the principles. I know that getting secondary care specialists to work together with primary care specialists, it's almost unheard of in some countries, and it had become difficult in Northern Ireland, but we managed to do it. All medical royal colleges agreed on these 10 principles, which contained issues that were pertinent to individual different specialties. The agreed principles recognised that the old way of doing things were no longer effective and that we needed to adopt and embrace values which subsequently influence our behaviours. Only by embracing these values did we feel that general practitioners and hospital consultants could move forward together to a common purpose. As you will see, the ten principles are based around mutual respect, collaborative and professional courtesy. They were also focused on influencing our new and future generations of medical students and how these doctors as well in specialist training. And we all equally recognised that for these principles to work and be seen to work, that we needed to lead by example. That was easier said than done. To launch the 10 principles, we publicised them heavily using social media, college chairs blogs and by word of mouth. The document was given a long title which explains what it contains. We called it 
professional behaviours and communicational principles for working across primary and secondary care interfaces in Northern Ireland. I know it's not the catchiest of titles. We launched the Professional Behaviours and Communication Principles document in 2018. It is jointly owned by all 14 medical royal colleges listed at the base of the document. It is not a GP document, it is owned by all of us. GPs can access it on the Royal College of GPs website under the Northern Ireland section. It was also subsequently adopted by the Academy of Medical Royal Colleges, which represents all medical royal colleges in the UK. And you can access it using the links that we have shown. We've developed a much shorter title for Twitter, which we use to publicise the document, and it has lasted. Our hashtag Dear Colleague title is the one that we most often use now. We launched a positive week-long campaign in March 2018, where we encouraged all GPs to start their referral letters to their hospital consultants with the greeting, Dear Colleague. At the same time, we encouraged hospital consultants to write to their discharge letters to GPs, also using the same greeting, Dear Colleague. The purpose of this was to re-establish that professional courtesy and mutual respect, which are the key values we wanted to embed in our work. It seems really simple, but it did have the effect of making each of us stop and think what we were doing, what we were going to write, how we were going to phrase the letter, and importantly, what language we were going to use. The document used TENS principles. They are intended to influence medical education and training to highlight the importance of leading by examples and of the modelling of behaviours of senior clinicians. We established early in our discussions that the need for a common goal was important to both parties. Patient safety was paramount and issues such as job satisfaction, retention and recruitment were similar to both primary and secondary care specialties. The first three of the ten principles are on the slide. We are keen that the, the first three words of the first principle should be the most important and the most impactful. They read, leading by example. We felt that a senior clinician's behaviour was so important to highlight the attitudes and the development of behaviours of junior staff. It needs highlighting for both GPs and hospital consultants though. It is vital that our language is courteous, respectful and professional when we talk about and talk to other colleagues. We debated at length about the importance of communication when there are changes in treatment plans or in a patient's condition. We were also keen to ensure that the principles document was a practical document, and this is reflected in each principle. We were not explicit about ensuring that these communications were done face-to-face -face or telephone, and we acknowledged that there was frequently different places and different ways that this was best done. In principle four, we highlighted the importance of communication when transferring the care of a patient to another colleague or seeking an opinion. That colleague needs all the information in a clear and concise format, ideally outlining a specific aim or objective. This was an issue raised by our physician colleagues who were frequently receiving referral letters from GPs with poor information or an unclear request or specific aim. In Principle 5, we were keen to bring in the views of our patients. We had discussions with the patient group in the Royal College of GPs where they emphasised the importance of having clear and concise information about what trajectory a referral or course of treatment would have. We were keen that our patients did not attend any service with unrealistic expectations. In Principle 6, we tried not to commit any other team or individual to a particular action without checking that it was reasonable or practical. This came back to the original value we discussed about walking a day in another colleague's shoes. In Principle 7, we urged colleagues not to hand over work to another clinical team unless we were sure that this could be done safely. It highlighted the need to instigate practical and basic tests and plans, but the ethos was is that we should not hand over work to another colleague or teams if we cannot do it ourselves, but we should check first to make sure the handover team can take on the patient and the workload involved. Principle 8 is an acknowledgement of a problem raised by GPs. GPs were finding that investigations such as blood tests or x-rays, which had been requested by secondary care colleagues, were then forwarded to GPs to follow up without any indication of a treatment plan 
or suggested follow-up activity. Our GPs may have been asked to take responsibility for all tests and investigations without knowing the context in which the decisions are taken. So it was important that this issue was recognised and that the requesting doctor or clinical team who initiated tests also reviewed the results of those tests and took the appropriate action. Principle 9 recognises the complications of this when big teams in hospitals such as in emergency departments were unable to do this work. Principle 9 recognises that this is sometimes not possible as individual, but it urges a courteous sharing of information with direct communication, ideally by telephone, to resolve any issues. The last principle highlighted the need to respond quickly when our colleagues try to contact us. It embodies the professional courtesy that is required in professional communication. Unfortunately, resources did not allow us to instigate specific pieces of work or to take this project as far as we would have liked in Northern Ireland. Despite that, there have been many examples we have witnessed, but without categorised evidence of its success. For example, in 2018, a proposal was made to close the emergency department in Dizzy Hill Hospital in Urie in County Down. This is a district hospital covering a very broad geographical area with 150 beds. It has provided secondary care services since 1841. The threat of the closure of this hospital caused a public outcry and concern, both from the public and from GPs. We were going to lose established patient pathways and community-facing diagnostic services. The Pathfinder Group, which offered a much appreciated direct assessment unit, was retained as a service after extensive discussion with local stakeholders. This unit was truly providing joined up primary care. GPs could telephone the service for same day assessment, providing diagnostics and initial treatment of care for many conditions which could not have been managed in primary care clinics. This included ultrasound scans for suspected deep vein thrombosis and intravenous antibiotics for potentially early sepsis. However, the principles document was never mentioned or cited as the reason for this more joined up thinking, but it is hoped that the ethos of this document of what it tried to initiate was the success. We would really like to systemically assess the success of incorporating the 10 principles of communication into our clinical lives. Another example is that of the diagnosis of bowel cancer, which can be difficult for GPs in the community. Traditional faecal occult blood testing had become not sensitive or specific enough compared to the modern symptomatic qualitative faecal immunochemical testing, QFIT, which is now currently recommended as the gold standard practice. Colleagues in colorectal surgery were struggling to meet with the demand of the number of colonoscopies required by GPs. GPs wanted reassurance that their patients didn't have bowel cancer and so we had joint goals where we all wanted our patients who had colorectal cancer to be diagnosed early and we only wanted patients who really required it to undergo colonoscopy. Considerable time and effort were taken by the Northern Ireland Cancer Research Network or NICAN for consultant surgeons and GPs to discuss a new way of working. The Cancer Research Network set up a series of interactive lunchtime talks where participating clinicians could ask questions, seek advice, which led to better clinical care pathways being agreed by both primary and secondary clinicians. During the lunchtime sessions, there was ample opportunity for questions to be asked, for clinical issues to be raised with the service designed to resolve those questions and answers. Once again, this is a good example of success of applying the 10 basic principles based on professional courtesy and mutual respect. The most powerful example of the success of the Dear Colleague initiative was through the establishment of the GP Society in Queen's University in 2018. The GP Society is for undergraduates in our medical school, for them to learn and celebrate family medicine. This organisation has gone from strength to strength and they run a series of educational podcasts providing direct links between medical students and general practice. The GP Society highlights what a varied academic and stimulating career general practice can be. And the group provides practical help with OSCE practice, exam practice, exposure to GPs with specialist interests 
and they have wide-ranging discussions. I so wish I had had a GP society when I was a medical student. These students have run seminars on a variety of topics, including highlighting portfolio career opportunities within general practice. Their most impressive series of talks were entitled the Dear Colleague Series. These talks celebrate interprofessional working across specialties, which the students recognise will improve whole patient care. These talks involved a variety of healthcare professionals from primary care, secondary care, community and voluntary sectors and highlighted important topics such as domestic abuse, alcohol addiction, Parkinson's disease and perinatal mental health. Our students have embraced the dear colleague values and recognised the importance of working collaboratively with other healthcare professionals for the benefits of patients. In 2019, Health Education England published its report, The Future Doctor Programme. We see this as one of the legacies of the Hashtag Dear Colleague initiative, where the report highlighted the need for the doctors of the future to be generalists. Our view is that we need communication pathways to be as effective as possible, embedding the core values of professional courtesy and mutual respect would ensure the interfaces between professions will never again become barriers. Thank you for listening today. Please do follow up about the Dear Colleague initiative and maybe you could introduce it into your own locality. If you do, I'm sure it will lead to better relationships between us as GPs and our secondary care colleagues. But more important than that, it could lead to better patient care and better clinical outcomes. Thank you.